My name is Dan Friedman, the director of the Stroke Center at Hillsborough Medical Center, and I want to share with you some information about stroke and stroke care today. This will be uh, an update. Uh, I've given this lecture many times in the past, uh, and I'm hoping you find this information useful. Uh, if you have questions about stroke or questions about your health care, I would encourage you to contact your health care provider uh, regarding those questions. So let's go ahead and start. Uh, first, we're going to be talking primarily about ischemic stroke, and this type of stroke occurs when an artery gets blocked uh, in the brain or a blood clot breaks loose from somewhere uh, in the body. I'm going to mention the other type of stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, a little later, and that occurs primarily when there's bleeding uh, into the brain. Ischemic stroke makes up most of the strokes uh, that, we, that we see. Almost 90% of the strokes are ischemic, and you can see in the two uh, slides, a picture of a hemorrhagic stroke where you see a blood vessel has broken and there is some bleeding into the brain compared to an ischemic stroke where the artery is plugged and the area of the brain that is fed by that artery uh, becomes damaged. And this occurs after a, a very short time. You can see on the far left of the screen a few different ways the arteries can get plugged. Uh, on the top, you can see a little clot that broke loose and floated downstream into the carotid arteries and can plug up those arteries. And this can break loose uh, from the heart. Uh, sometimes it can occur in a condition called atrial fibrillation, where the heart does not beat properly and a clot can break loose. Uh, on the bottom, you see an artery plugged up from high cholesterol and high blood sugar and high blood pressure and uh, diabetes with that cholesterol plaque. And that can either plug up a tiny artery entirely, or uh, the uh, inflammation can uh, and the blockage can break loose a little fleck, which can float downstream and plug up a very tiny, uh, tiny artery further down. So there are several different types of strokes, and I mentioned this on the uh, on the prior slide uh, already. Some strokes are caused by atherosclerotic uh, large vessel occlusion, and this is blockage in the in the big arteries, such as the carotid arteries or some of the major arteries uh, in uh, in the brain. And again, this can happen from a variety, or it is caused by a variety of other uh, medical conditions. Another type of a stroke can occur when a small vessel is plugged up, and these are the tiny arteries uh, in the brain. Uh, sort of at the very end, right before the brain, and they also can become blocked up. And when patients come in with this, they often have uh, very uh, symptoms that sometimes suggest this is the case, uh, such as very severe symptoms that come and go rapidly over uh, over several hours. Um, although you'd think if it was a small vessel being plugged up, it wouldn't be as serious. These strokes can be just as serious and just as disabling uh, as can the large vessel strokes. Cardiac embolism, I mentioned previously, and again, this will occur if a blood clot forms in the heart. This can happen in a condition called atrial fibrillation, where the top of the heart, instead of beating regularly and pumping the blood down to the bottom of the heart, starts vibrating. And rather than doing a full pump, the blood can pool there and a clot can form, which can in turn break loose and float off uh, into, uh, into the brain or elsewhere uh, in the body. There are also a small number of people that have a small hole in their heart called a PFO or a patent foramen ovale, which sometimes uh, can uh, form a clot or a clot can break loose from a blood clot in the leg from a deep venous thrombosis or DVT and then pass through the heart without going to the lungs and go to the brain. Cryptogenic is an overly fancy word that essentially means the stroke happened and we are not sure why. Uh, we cannot provide a good reason in uh, a small number of cases with strokes. Uh, often uh, with extra testing, we are able to pinpoint the cause, but initially uh, during the care of a stroke, sometimes we can't find small vessel disease, large vessel disease, or a cardiac embolism, and extra testing is needed to uh, investigate this. And finally, other. These are other rarer kinds of strokes. Conditions such as vasculitis, which is an immune attack on blood vessels can cause strokes. There are some rare genetic diseases which can cause strokes. Uh, 
Uh, a small number of people have something called a hypercoagulable state where their blood is too thick or too likely to clot, and that can lead to, uh, to strokes. Or occasionally you'll see someone with an injury to their neck who then has a tear in the artery with something called a dissection, uh, which can cause a stroke. I'd like to share uh, a, a video with you. Uh, this is something that was made uh, in collaboration with OHSU and uh, by staff at OHSU uh, as a jingle, so you can remember some of the uh, some of the symptoms of uh, of stroke. Uh, I'll warn you, this uh, you won't be able to get this song out of your head. Uh, it's short, but I'm going to go ahead and play it for you right now. B do you know the signs of stroke? Remember the acronym Be Fast. B is for balance if you can't stand. E is for eyes if things are blurry. And F is for face if you got a little sagging. A is for arm if it starts to drag. S is for speech if you slur what you say. Call 911 and call right away. T is for time and the time is now. Be Fast. B E F A S T. Sing along at ohsu.edu slash be fast. So first we start with balance, sudden trouble with balance, sudden dizziness, uh, loss of coordination can be a symptom of a stroke. This can be a symptom of many other uh, conditions uh, as well. Uh, vertigo, which is a sudden sense of spinning or motion in the head can occur with a stroke, particularly in the back of the brain in an area called the uh, cerebellum. However, it can be caused by many other things, including inner ear problems, Dizziness can be a symptom of stroke, although it can be caused by problems with the heart or low blood pressure as well. And trouble with balance and walking can occur from stroke, from weakness in the legs, from dizziness, although that can come from many other conditions such as back problems or damage to the nerves in the leg or feet. So one of the challenges for physicians and for patients is to determine what is causing uh, the symptoms. But if these symptoms come on suddenly, uh, that may suggest a stroke. And so B is for balance. E is for eyes, sudden loss of vision or sudden difficulty, sudden trouble with seeing in one or both eyes can be a symptom of stroke. Many people have problems that cause vision loss. I am wearing my glasses now uh, with progressive lenses so I can see close and far away at the same time. But if you would experience a sudden loss of vision in one or both eyes, that may be a symptom of stroke or a symptom of a stroke actually not occurring in the brain but affecting the eye. A clot can break loose and rather than going up to the brain, it can go to the arteries that lead into the eye and cause a sudden loss of vision. This is something called amaurosis fugax. And what patients usually experience is a sudden curtain or loss of vision over one eye. Their vision in the other eye is usually fine. Uh, and this is a, uh, again, a medical emergency and something you should seek uh, medical care for uh, immediately. Patients can also experience loss of vision in both eyes. And this often occurs from strokes, particularly in the back of the brain in the vision centers called the occipital lobe, although there are other areas of the brain that can cause this as well. Sometimes a patient will come in complaining of loss of vision in the left eye, but what often happens with a stroke is it's not loss of vision in just the left eye, it's loss of vision in both eyes just on the left side. So if you test either eye with one open or closed, the patient may be able to see just fine over on the right, but when you test the left visual field, they'll have vision loss there. And this can occur in the top of the visual field, on the bottom of the visual field, or in both areas, uh, it would be unusual but possible for someone to have sudden total loss of vision in both eyes or sudden blindness uh, from uh, a stroke, although it can occur if there are strokes simultaneously on both sides of the brain. Sudden drooping of the face on one side or the other can be a symptom of stroke. This is the F in be fast. Uh, the patients will experience a droop on one side in their lip. Uh, their eye will actually be open wider than it should be on that side, and you can see a sagging in, uh, in the face. Uh, there are other conditions which can cause this as well. Bell's palsy, which many people have heard of, can cause drooping on one side of the face. Typically with a stroke, uh, the lower part of the face is primarily affected, although the eye can be affected. Often with uh, a stroke, 
the wrinkles in the forehead, which you can see if you raise your eyebrows up, uh, will remain intact. And with Bell's palsy, they will go flat on that side. Although in rare cases, a stroke can affect that area of the face as well. So sudden onset of weakness on one side of the face. Uh, again, this could be a Bell's palsy, but it could also be a symptom of uh, a stroke. Sudden weakness or numbness in one arm or leg uh, can be uh, a symptom of stroke. Many people have woke up with a tingly hand and you shake it for a moment or two and it goes away. However, if there's sudden loss of feeling or numbness or tingling, pins and needles feeling uh, in your arm or your leg that come on at the same time, this can also occur in the face at the same time. Could occur in the face and the arm, in just the arm and the leg, and just the leg, or rarely in just the arm uh, as well, and this can be a symptom of a stroke. Again, this could also be a symptom of a pinched nerve elsewhere in the body or something as simple as carpal tunnel, which is a pinched nerve in the wrist. Uh, usually this numbness and tingling is uh, does not go away after just a moment or two, and usually it's uh, not something that occurs uh, just on awakening. This can occur when you wake up with a stroke, but it can also occur at any time uh, over the day. Uh, you can also see weakness in that same area or loss of strength. So not only could there be numbness or tingling, but the patients may be able to move their arm. They may not feel it's as strong as it should be. They may have difficulty with walking or strength, or as I already mentioned, some drooping or weakness in uh, the face. This also can occur in the face, the arm, and the leg, or all of these uh, areas together. This can be very mild to the point where you just lose your grip to very severe, uh, and uh, some patients are unable to move their arm or leg at all. It would be very unusual to see this occur on both sides of the body at the same time. This usually occurs just on the left or just on the right. Uh, again, if it occurred on both sides at the same time, that would suggest to your doctor that may be another condition that is uh, that is causing this. So this is the A in uh, B fast. S is speech, sudden trouble with speech or trouble with speaking, sudden confusion, sudden trouble getting the words out or understanding words, or severe slurring of speech, which would sound like someone is drunk or intoxicated. Sometimes this can be severe enough you can't understand a patient at all. There are some patients with stroke that have something called aphasia, which is the trouble with speaking, which is very disabling. They are unable to get words out. They struggle to think of the words. When they say the words, they either stutter or trip over the words to get them out and can't really form a sentence. Or in some cases, they use total nonsense words or even words that don't make any, any sense when they say them or link them together. For example, you could ask someone how they are feeling today and someone with aphasia might say, the sky is blue fire truck. Something like that that really makes no sense, but sounds like a, uh, a sentence. Uh, this can be very disabling because the problem is not with your lips or mouth or speech, it's with the language centers in the brain. You can ask someone to try to write, but they'll have the same problem in that situation. They'll be unable to write the words uh, correctly, and they really struggle to communicate. Some patients have trouble understanding the words said, said to them as well, and will appear to be confused. Uh, all of these symptoms that I've mentioned, the balance, the eyes, the face, uh, the arm and leg strength and the speech can occur either individually with stroke or they can all occur in some combination together. Someone can show up with difficulty speaking, dizzy and weak and numb on one side of the body, uh, or it could be just difficulty with speech. But again, with stroke, most typically these symptoms come on very suddenly rather than uh, gradually. And finally, I don't put much on this slide, but time, time is critical. There are treatments, which I'm going to talk about in a few, uh, in a few moments, which can be given uh, for stroke to help minimize the effect of stroke and in some cases to help reverse some of the symptoms of stroke. However, uh, these treatments need to be given quickly. The sooner they are given, the better. Time is brain, and the longer we wait to give these treatments, the less chance they will be uh, effective uh, for you. So 
stroke is a medical emergency, and we generally recommend uh, picking up the phone and calling 911. We uh, generally advise against getting in your car because of the disability and symptoms from this and trying to drive to the hospital or asking your family to drive you to the hospital. Uh, the paramedics will show up, they will be able to recognize the symptoms of stroke and they will take you to the nearest hospital. So even if you are very close to, uh, to I'm sorry, even t uh, if you have a doctor on another side, on the other side of town and they work at a certain hospital, they might take you to the closest hospital because with stroke, the sooner they can get you to a hospital that's prepared to treat stroke and take care of stroke, the better. Time is brain. And again, I'd recommend calling 911 uh, we generally suggest avoiding calling your doctor's office and leaving a message for them uh, for this either. It sometimes takes hours or longer to uh, get a message back from a doctor. And when people call, I know you all here on the machine and on the call chain, uh, if this is a medical emergency, please call up and uh, please hang up and dial 911. This would constitute a medical emergency. So there are other symptoms that can occur with stroke. This is by no means all of them. We just covered BFAST, and those are a, a good mix of the symptoms we see and deal with, but there are others. A sudden severe headache with no known cause can be a symptom of stroke, particularly a bleeding stroke. An explosive headache that is the worst headache ever can be a ruptured aneurysm, which is a kind of a bleeding stroke. But there are other kinds of bleeding strokes in the brain. We've primarily focused on ischemic or strokes that occur with blocked arteries, but I am going to talk more about bleeding strokes in just a few moments. A transient ischemic attack, a TIA it is called, or a mini stroke uh, is occurs when one of these arteries gets blocked up temporarily and then the blockage clears. The clot breaks loose and disintegrates or the plugging of the artery breaks up and blood flow is restored. These symptoms typically last a few hours. Technically, the definition is less than 24 hours, although usually it's a, a few hours uh, at most, and then the symptoms resolve. Uh, to, to be a TIA, the patient has to really make a full recovery from their symptoms. They are weak and numb on one side with trouble speaking, and then the symptoms completely clear up. This is still a medical emergency. This is our chance and your chance to prevent the TIA from turning into a full-blown stroke, which does not usually resolve in a few hours or a few days. Uh, with a TIA, with a brain scan, most of the time we see no scarring on the brain or injury to the brain uh, as a result. And again, patients make a full recovery, but it's an emergency and uh, several medical tests are needed to assess this and assess the risk for a stroke, which is significantly higher in the next few days, few weeks, and few months after a, uh, a TIA. So I told you I would mention hemorrhagic stroke, and this is a bleeding stroke in the brain. This is, in a lot of ways, the opposite of an ischemic stroke. Instead of an artery getting plugged up, in this case, an artery or a vein breaks in the brain and there is bleeding. And this is much less common. It makes up about 10% of the strokes uh, we uh, deal with. And you can see in the cartoon at the bottom a picture of a ruptured artery and uh, blood leaking out of it into the brain. What is challenging with this is, although I did mention headaches are more common with this type of stroke, uh, they don't always occur with this type of stroke. And so the symptoms can be exactly the same as they can with an ischemic stroke. The same BFAST type symptoms that I mentioned before, sudden trouble with balance, eyes, weakness, numbness on one side of the body, difficulty with speech can all occur with a hemorrhagic stroke. So the question in your mind should be, how do I tell? How do we know what this is? Well, what we recommend is a brain scan, and in particular, a CAT scan, which should be done immediately uh, on arrival to the ER for uh, stroke symptoms. This study can be done without contrast dye that is sometimes given uh, for uh, for tests, and we'll talk about a few of those in a little bit. Uh, but a non-contrast CT of the brain can help us tell the difference between an ischemic stroke and a hemorrhagic stroke. Interestingly, in some cases, 
the ischemic stroke won't show up on the initial CAT scan, although blood almost always will. And I'm going to show you some examples of this. There's several different types of hemorrhagic strokes uh, below in the slide. You can see the interparenchymal hemorrhage. First, we're, we're looking at uh, CAT scans. You can see the white rim on the outside of each of these, which is the skull and the brain underneath. The black holes in the middle of the brain are called ventricles, and these are areas in the brain that are filled with fluid and they are normal. But you can see the bright white spot uh, over uh, in the brain uh, in the first picture, the interparenchymal stroke, where a patient probably had high blood pressure and had an artery break. Uh, the blood leaked into the brain in that area and would cause stroke symptoms on the opposite side of the body. Uh, for, most, uh, for most strokes and most injuries to the brain, the symptoms on one side of the brain will affect the opposite side of the body. The way this is set up in that first picture, we're seeing that blood on the right side of the brain. I know in the picture, it looks like it's the left, but that's actually the right side of the brain. This picture looks as if you're taking a picture from below the brain, um, and that would affect the left side of the body. That patient may have weakness or numbness on that side of the body. And again, the CAT scan should show this uh, right away in the, uh, in the ER. Uh, this type of stroke, this interparenchymal hemorrhage, often happens with severe high blood pressure, uh, although there are other causes as well. The next picture is a picture of something called the subdural hematoma, and this is actually bleeding outside of the brain, which can occur after a fall. Uh, the blood will collect, and you can see it is actually pushing the brain over to the other side. You can see those white lines in the middle uh, as they're shoved to the side, and you can see that those ventricles look squished or pushed over to the side. Um, again, this can occur in people after a fall. Uh, there's a higher risk in people on some kinds of blood thinners as well. Uh, if these are very small, sometimes we just observe them uh, and don't do any treatment and the blood can be reabsorbed. If they're large or if they're compressing the brain, as you can see in this picture, often we'll contact our colleagues in neurosurgery and they will drain the blood out. The next picture is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and you can see the white lines all throughout the brain. You can see the arrow pointing uh, to them, that white uh, streaking, which is not there in some of the other pictures. This occurs when an aneurysm ruptures, and patients will have the worst headache of their lives. It comes on like an explosion, or it's called a thunderclap. Uh, headache. These patients can have seizures and often are unconscious. This also is a medical uh, emergency and is a uh, very grave uh, condition with uh, very significant mortality. Finally, a picture of an epidural hematoma, which is another kind of bleeding which can occur uh, outside of the brain. You can see uh, the subdural kind of looks like a crescent moon, and this is more uh, curving inward into the brain, but it has the same effects. This blood builds up usually more slowly. So initially there can be a head injury and someone can black out and then they regain consciousness. But as this blood slowly builds up, uh, it will cause loss of consciousness as well as weakness and other symptoms similar to what we've talked about with stroke. This too is a neurosurgical emergency uh, and uh, often the neurosurgeons will drain these epidural hematomas. So in a medical emergency, you call 911, they take you to the ER, you'll meet doctors and nurses in the ER, but there is unfortunately not a neurologist that is in the ER 24 seven. And so uh, we have come up with a solution for that, which is telemedicine. And this is a picture of our robot uh, in the ER, we call it. It's actually a computer screen, uh, and the computer screen has several cameras on it, and we are able to mute, move the screen and tilt so we can talk to different peoples in the room, people in the room, and then zoom into the patient. You can zoom in close enough that you can look at their pupils uh, with this computer. And what this allows for is it will allow the neurologist who may be at home, who may be in their office, who may be at another hospital, to log in immediately when a patient is in the emergency room with a stroke and evaluate that patient. That doctor probably will have their computer open and be able to see all the test results, including the labs, your medical history, the CAT scan or MRI if it's done. They'll be able to make an assessment through the computer, do a full exam, 
discuss your symptoms with you, your family, or the emergency room doctor, and try to make a decision about the best treatment. This has been a very big innovation for medicine. Uh, years ago, we would receive emergency calls from the ER, and the neurologist would have to stop what they're doing wherever they were and rush to the ER. But all of us don't live close, and sometimes it could take 20, 30 minutes or more uh, to reach the hospital. But this allows almost uh, instantaneous access to uh, a stroke uh, doc physician. So I mentioned uh, acute stroke care in the ER requires a CAT scan. And I pulled this picture off the internet. The internet is filled with pictures of cats and here are some cats doing a CAT scan. CAT scan, some people get nervous. Is this going to be a tube? That's, that's the MRI. The CAT scan is generally an open arch, open donut. Uh, most people with claustrophobia have no difficulty getting a CAT scan done. A CAT scan is very short. It takes a few minutes. Um, not nearly as long as an MRI, and produces a good picture of the brain. In some cases, in very large strokes or in strokes that occurred hours ago, you can see some dark spots uh, in the brain, and that's where the stroke occurs. I'm referring to an ischemic type stroke. Sometimes the CAT scan, if it's done immediately after a stroke, won't show any abnormality and will need to be repeated in 12 or 24 hours, or will need to consider getting an MRI. Remember, however, if it's a bleeding type stroke, one of the several that I mentioned before, this will likely show up immediately on the CAT scan. CTA stands for a CT angiogram or MRA, uh, magnetic resonance angiography. These are pictures of the blood vessels in the brain. And we use these in some cases in patients with stroke. Every single patient may not need this. For example, a patient with a small vessel stroke, which I mentioned at the very beginning, those arteries are too small to show up on this test. This is good to catch the large artery blockage or the tears or the dissections in the artery uh, I mentioned uh, before. And this will take a picture of the arteries in the head and in the neck looking for uh, blockages, including clots or atherosclerosis. A carotid ultrasound is another test which is very useful in uh, assessing stroke patients. And this is often done after uh, arrival uh, at the hospital, sometimes the next day. This is not as urgent uh, a test as the uh, CAT scan. Uh, if the carotid artery has severe blockage, there are cases where we will ask a surgeon to go in and open up that artery, and it can either have a stent put into it, or they can do a surgery called a carotid endarterectomy, where they clear out the blockage in the artery. This is most typically done when there's very severe blockage, and that very blocked artery was responsible for the stroke. Occasionally, you'll find blockage in another artery, that has not caused a stroke or is not related. And then it's a much more complicated question uh, as to whether or not that you should have surgery for that artery or just go on to uh, medical therapy. I'm going to keep talking now about other tests we might do, although like the carotid ultrasound, these tests are not quite as urgent, won't be done immediately. Often they'll be done later in the day or the next day. Next test is an echocardiogram, and this is an ultrasound that is done of uh, of the heart. Uh, this is a painless procedure. Uh, they put a small wand on your chest. You can see a picture of it, and it shoots sound waves into the heart and gets a good picture. And what we're looking for is, is there any sign of a blood clot sitting anywhere in the heart that could have broken loose and caused the stroke? Sometimes we will do a test called a bubble study, uh, where we take a small syringe connected to an IV and we agitate the blood to try to produce some small bubbles and then we inject it back in and we look to see do these bubbles pass through a hole in the heart. I mentioned earlier the PFO or patent furry middle valley. This is how this is diagnosed. MRI can be done uh, for stroke and very often is. There are some limitations. MRI is a very small tunnel uh, that you have to go into. Sometimes people will not fit, although most do. Some people struggle with claustrophobia, and while we can give medication to help with that, sometimes it's just not enough. So it can be a challenging test for some patients to get, although most are able to get uh, an MRI done. The MRI gives you a much 
more detailed and better picture of the brain. The other good thing about an MRI is it will pick up uh, the ischemic stroke uh, right away compared to the CAT scan where you may have to wait much, much longer. You can see in the bottom picture, a picture of the brain uh, where there's a white streak down the middle. This is an area of the brain that would affect primarily the leg on the opposite side of the body. So I would expect this patient to be weak in their right leg. Remember the left side of the brain affects the right side of their body. And then there's a picture of uh, an MRI, the little tube you go in. Of course, we have to screen patients and make sure they don't have a pacemaker, any kind of implanted computer, or other metal in the body, which uh, because this uh, test is done with a magnet and uh, that would be dangerous. MRI is sometimes done uh, within a short time after patients get to the hospital. Sometimes it has to wait till, uh, till the next day as well, but can be very helpful in identifying the cause of stroke, uh, large vessel, small vessel, embolic. There may be a pattern where there's small strokes scattered on both sides of the brain, and that would suggest an embolus came from the heart and broke up like uh, shotgun pellets and spread out into the brain. So I mentioned before, time is brain. Is that an emergency? There's pictures of these clocks to remind us of this. And why is that? And, and the answer is because we have some medications that we can give uh, if we can start them soon enough. Uh, there are limits on how far out uh, these medicines can be given. I'm going to mention two, TPA and TNK. We've just started using TNK more often recently. TNK can be given as a, a single injection rather than a longer infusion like TPA. Every minute counts. The sooner we give this, the better. And there are some limits as to how long you can give it after a stroke. If you give it too late or too many hours out, it may expose you to higher risk without any real benefit. Typically, these medicines are best within the first 90 minutes. They can be given in some cases up to three hours after the stroke symptoms started. And in a few instances, we will extend that to four and a half hours, depending on the situation. However, after that, these medicines, these clot busters, TPA and TNK, uh, are not given, again, because they raise the risk of complications, such as bleeding, since they are uh, clot buster drugs, uh, such as bleeding, without really uh, any significant uh, benefit at that point. Uh, these patients are not a miracle uh, cure for stroke, but they do lower the impact uh, significantly and raise the chance of a uh, good recovery. There are a long, there is a long checklist we have to go through to make sure you're not at any significant risk of complications before we can give this medication, including checking your medicine list to make sure you're not on any very strong blood thinners, uh, such as warfarin or apixaban, uh, as well as checking your blood counts and blood sugars and a variety of other tests first. What else can be done? Well, a thrombectomy, where we put in a catheter and go up to those arteries in the brain, particularly if they did that CT angiogram and they found one of the large arteries is blocked up and it's big enough to get to. This is an actual picture. You can see on the left an angiogram, one of the uh, arteries in the brain in a patient I was caring for who came into the emergency room uh, with sudden symptoms on the opposite side of the body, difficulty with speech and uh, weakness. Uh, we found the blood clot, or you can see a cutoff in the artery, uh, and I will, uh, you'll, it'll be quite clear where you're looking for that cutoff uh, in the uh, next slide. I'm not sure if you can see that arrow, but I'm circling that area right now. Uh, we contacted our colleagues, and one of the specialists went in with a catheter, which you can see over on the other side of the screen, and actually pulled the clot out. And there you can see the difference in those two arteries. That's the same artery taken, uh, picture taken from the same place. And you can see all those blood vessels uh, where the blood flow was restored. This patient uh, made a very good recovery. They were not completely back to normal, but they had impro improved dramatically uh, by the time they were uh, discharged from the hospital. Another important uh, evaluation at the hospital is assessment for rehabilitation. Uh, after the patient has gone through the immediate assessment, we've had the CAT scan, we've run the tests, 
uh, to see what has caused the stroke. We've made decision about medications. It's critical to get a physical therapist to see the patient and our therapists will come in, take the patient's for walk for walks. If they can't walk yet, they'll start working with you in bed on exercises to rebuild your strength. We may ask for an occupational therapist to see you as well, and they'll help you with sort of day to day activities which are needed uh, for trouble with your arms or difficulty dressing, brushing your teeth, grooming. Occupational therapy is critical. And finally, a speech therapist may be asked to come in and see you and they can help both with trouble with speaking such as slurred speech or aphasia, as I mentioned, as well as trouble with swallowing, uh, dysphagia, which can occur after a stroke, sometimes to the point where people will temporarily need a feeding tube or in some cases even uh, permanently. Uh, for all our stroke patients, we uh, order uh, therapy, typically physical therapy, although sometimes the other therapies as well, depending on the patient's symptoms. So what are the other preventative measures that should be taken at uh, at this point? This is a list of both the risk factors uh, for uh, for stroke uh, and the uh, treatments uh, for them. Uh, severe high blood pressure can be a cause of stroke. Interestingly, at the time you are having a stroke, we like to allow the patient's blood pressure to be high to help get the blood up to the brain. And this is primarily with the ischemic or blocked artery type stroke. If this is a hemorrhagic or bleeding type stroke, we try to lower the blood pressure sooner. But for the first few days after an ischemic stroke, uh, we will allow someone to have very high blood pressure and then we'll start gradually bringing it down. Keeping that blood pressure under the best control you can is the best way to, uh, one of the best ways to help prevent a stroke in the future. Lipids or high cholesterol can be a risk for stroke and we always measure a fasting lipid panel or check your uh, your lipids uh, cholesterol first thing the next morning before you've had uh, breakfast uh, any elevation in the ldl which is the bad cholesterol will probably cause your doctor to recommend medication for this there are many patients that will say i prefer not to take a medication i would like to try to change my diet and while i absolutely support that and i think that's critical in uh, improving your cholesterol generally we also recommend this medication as well to try to speed the process along uh, and uh, to ensure that it's bringing your cholesterol uh, down Diabetes or high blood sugar is a major risk for uh, stroke. Uh, when patients are admitted to the hospital uh, at Hillsborough Medical Center, they will have a neurologist caring for them, but they'll also have a hospitalist who does the job of your primary care doctor, but they do it for patients that are in the hospital. And they're going to help us take care of your high blood pressure, your high cholesterol, as well as high blood sugar. Uh, we want to try to get that blood sugar under control and keep it from being too high or too low while you're in the hospital and then come up with a plan to keep it under good control when you are out of the hospital. A blood thinner, which I will mention in more detail on the next slide, uh, is very often used. Uh, these are antithrombotics. Uh, smoking is a major uh, risk factor for stroke and quitting smoking is critical. There are many treatments are avail available to help with this. Uh, but again, uh, for all of our patients that are uh, still smoking, we strongly encourage them to quit. And, and finally, long-term heart monitoring. You see actually two pictures of two different uh, heart monitors here. In the first one, you see a little sticker uh, that goes on, which we place before you leave the hospital in some cases. This is typically when we diagnose that cryptogenic stroke. And this heart monitor is a tiny computer that you wear for two weeks and then you stick in the mail. Uh, and when we get it back, the heart doctors evaluate this and they are looking for that atrial fibrillation. And the longer we monitor the heart, the better the chance we have to find this if you have it, because some patients will have that and their heart rate will be normal some days and other days they will have uh, atrial fibrillation. So it's critical for those cryptogenic strokes that we do some kinds of heart monitoring. In some instances, uh, the uh, sticker the zeal patch that you see there uh, is not enough and we need to do additional long-term monitoring and then we switch to something called the loop recorder you can see a picture of that in that person's hand uh, this is a tiny computer that is inserted under the skin in the chest and will monitor the heart rhythm for months uh, at a time 
So how do we prevent stroke from there? I mentioned antithrombotics, and we will very often use blood thinners. Aspirin is actually an excellent uh, treatment for preventing stroke. And this is, again, after a patient has already had a stroke. That's what the focus is here, not on what to take uh, before, but if you've had a stroke, this is a treatment that's generally recommended. Uh, most patients, we recommend 81 milligrams of aspirin going to a higher dose or full dose of aspirin doesn't really make much of a big difference for uh, stroke patients. Sometimes we'll recommend a medication called clopidogrel, used to be called uh, Plavix. Sometimes we recommend it in combination with aspirin for 21 days or sometimes up to three months. We'll use both of them together, although long term for stroke, uh, they are not recommended due to the higher risk of bleeding, usually just aspirin or in some cases clopidogrel long term. Aspirin has also been combined with another medicine called dipyridamol together in the same pill. This is a medicine called uh, Agronox that is a two-time or sometimes a one-time-a-day medication which can also be used, although it's not used as often. Anticoagulation, these are the stronger blood thinners, warfarin or Coumadin or some of the newer ones. I mentioned uh, specifically Apixaban, which is also called Eliquis, but there are several others uh, as well that are available. These are primarily recommended for patients with atrial fibrillation uh, when, they, when they have stroke from the atrial fibrillation, when a clot comes from the heart to the brain. There are some other instances when these medications are used uh, as well. If we find severe blockage in the artery in your neck, uh, the carotid artery, you may consider a carotid end arterectomy, which I mentioned already, or stenting into the carotid artery. It's critical that we control your blood pressure. Initially, again, it will be quite high, but over the few days in the hospital, we'll work on bringing it down. And then when you're out of the hospital, uh, we generally will want you to follow up with your primary care, your cardiologist, or whoever is taking care of your blood pressure to try to get you down to a normal range. Very often, we will add a statin or high cholesterol uh, medication if your LDL is elevated at all. Sometimes we set a goal of an LDL uh, above 100 for starting this, or sometimes even as low as 70. And finally, I mentioned the rehabilitation assessment. So how can I help? What can you do or what should you know about this? I would suggest learning Be Fast. I, again, apologize you couldn't view the video, but you should have the link. Uh, and so I'd encourage you to watch that video to learn Be Fast so you can recognize stroke symptoms if you ever experience them or if anyone in your family or anyone you work with or know experiences these uh, symptoms. Again, remember, if you recognize those symptoms, it's critical to call 911 immediately. The other things that are very useful, I mentioned to you that we have a limited time window to decide about giving these clot buster medications in the emergency room. So we have to know exactly when these symptoms started, which can be very challenging. If someone goes to bed at 8 p.m. and wakes up at 9 a.m. the next day and was asleep the whole night, and they wake up with stroke symptoms, weak on one side, numb on one side with trouble speaking, we don't know when those symptoms actually came on. So we either want to know the time that they were last known well. When was someone with them uh, last and when were they acting uh, completely, uh, completely normally? Uh, or uh, we would want to know uh, the time uh, of onset of their uh, symptoms. Keeping a medication list is critical. Uh, and will, uh, excuse me for one second, for some reason something is popping up on the screen here, which hopefully you can't see. And there we go. Keeping a medication list is critical and will be helpful uh, for your physician. Bringing the medication list along with you to the uh, emergency room will help the doctors in deciding what medications uh, we may need to add. Uh, and finally, your medical history. Is there a history of atrial fibrillation? Is there a history of bleeding problems or other issues? High blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking. All this is important. Keeping a list of this 
uh, as well as a list of your allergies would be very, uh, very helpful. We do have electronic medical records and uh, that allows us to access a lot of your information. However, some uh, patients see a doctor that's not on the same system that's available at the hospital. Uh, so it's uh, it's critical we have this information in uh, in treating patients in the emergency room. I'd like to take take a minute to uh, remind you that we are a Joint Commission uh, certified primary stroke center. I'm happy to say we just underwent a reevaluation uh, this year and were uh, again uh, certified. Uh, congratulations to the staff at uh, Hillsborough Medical Center for this. Uh, and with that, I will uh, conclude. I'll remind you if this was a live lecture, I would be happy to take your questions, but because it is not, I'm going to encourage you to contact your doctor or healthcare provider uh, if you have any questions about stroke. Again, 